So, um, hi everyone, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and if you are one of my residents, you already know that, and if you're watching this on YouTube, well, you may already know that also, but we're gonna do some cases today, just some random derm path fun for uh, Friday afternoon. So here's, uh, here's case one. What have we here? Wow, that's a beaut. Anyone recognize that? Scabies is a thought. Myiasis is a thought. And tongueiasis is a thought. Good. Well, you know, you guys all recognize three arthropod organisms that would potentially live um, in this part of the skin. Scabies would be in the corneal layer. Myiasis is down in the dermis as kind of a nodule, and that's, that's bot fly, basically. And uh, Dr. Moore said this is something she would not want on her. And I agree completely. I'd like to have no arthropods um, burrowed in my skin, thank you. But boy, they sure are beautiful uh, when we get to see them. So um, this, is, uh, this is the only case I've ever seen of this. And I'll tell you a story behind it. I was, uh, I was a fellow and someone uh, put this case in my, my mailbox. And I, to this day, do not know who gave it to me. It was an old recut from like decades ago. And um, I never was able to find out who gave it to me. Someone recut one and put it with my name on it in a box. And so whoever you are, mystery pathologist out there, I love you dearly because you gave me the best tongueiasis and the only tongueiasis I've ever, ever seen. Because we don't really have this, to my knowledge, in the United States. Um, if any of you know differently, let me know. But mainly this is, um, this is uh, basically something that uh, is in um, Central and South America. Also, I think some in Africa and India. Um, in this case, you can see here that to orient yourself, this is the, the normal epidermis here. And look, the epidermis goes down here underneath this thing. So this whole huge flea, it's a, basically a sand flea, tunga penetrans, sand flea, chigo flea is the other name, and jigger flea. Um, I didn't make these names up. That's what, those are the different names for them uh, colloquially, depending on where you're from in the world. They live in the sand and burrow into the underneath the stratum corneum and you can see over time the skin is basically it's still mostly intact there's a little ulceration here tons of inflammation underneath but this is technically outside of the the skin it's above the epidermis but down below the corneal layer so it's basically expanded as it's grown and made this burrow yuck right and basically the flea burrows under there and it leaves a little hole in the stratum corneum and through that it can defecate and also lay eggs delightful huh and then eventually it dies and then the 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 flea goes away so like other arthropods, um, the uh, scabies mite would have this similar pattern, but it would be much smaller. And sometimes it's hard to, to conceptualize that. So you realize this is a big piece of tissue down to the subcutis. And this thing is basically the size of a, you know, most, it's about half the tissue it's taken up. Uh, a scabies mite would be about this size, about the size of the, era, the area I'm circling there. It would be a small little thing, but, but otherwise would look similar. Like all arthropods, basically, what you get is this chitinous shell around the outside. Sometimes the chitin has a pink color. Other times it has this bright yellowish color, and it's kind of refractile. I can't really show you the refractileness because it's a scan slide. It's one of the trade-off scan slides. You can't really flip that condenser and get the, the refractile uh, nature of things. But uh, in any case, oh, hold on a second. In any case, that's uh, that's chitin sometimes has that yellow look. Other times I feel like it looks pink. And chitin is like a carbohydrate, basically. It's a, that's my understanding of it. I'm not a biochemist, but a carbohydrate that forms the firm, um, the firm uh, um, outer exoskeleton of, um, of arthropods. And sometimes, let's see if it shows it here. I've seen it before, like on ticks, for example. Uh, yeah. If you look close, you can see like these little spiky ridge pattern or kind of grooves. It depends on how it's cut. And then inside you have some of these are probably internal organs. Some are probably eggs. I really have no idea. I'm not a, uh, I, my microscopic anatomy knowledge stops at humans. I, I've always looked with wonder at all the little parts inside arthropods, but I really don't know what all of them are. So if you're out there and you're an expert on um, tonga or arthropod microscopic anatomy, and you're watching this on YouTube, I would love to learn. So please teach me what all these little circles and, and cool things are. But in any case, in rec you need to recognize that this is, is chitinous exoskeleton material and that you're dealing with arthropod. That's the first step because that can help you with, like, uh, like you guys suggested, finding scabies, myiasis, bot fly, anytime there's gonna be some arthropod um, organism. And we say arthropod because remember that encompasses insects and also um, arachnids and other things that might be in the skin. 
So uh, this is the, the burrowed tunga, the mama sand flea here burrowed in um, into its home in someone's unfortunate foot. And you know, the dermis, as you can imagine, is none too happy with having this thing over top. Bajillion eosinophils down in here. And uh, for your viewing pleasure, I pulled up some uh, images here from Wikimedia. And if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll put links down below um, so you can see the sources of these and you can go view them for yourself and also to give credit to the, the uh, originators of these photos. Here's an example of the flea in its burrow and there's the little kind of uh, punct and the little hole that, it, that it's able to, uh, to extra, uh, extrude its eggs through. Here's another example. And let's see if it'll let us go closer. Again, you can see that little hole in the center. And this is one that has been extracted out of its burrow, and that's actually the whole organism. I'm not sure, I guess that's the, the abdominal end. I'm not sure where the head is, but, um, ooh, shudder, huh? That sounds terrible. And then um, here's a really terrible example where you can see there are numerous organisms. And from some of my reading, I've, I've read that they do tend to cluster around the, the kind of area between the sole and dorsum, like the, the lateral edges of the foot. And here's uh, one other view. So really quite terrible. This is obviously a very severe infestation with many, many and uh, um, uh, organisms burrowed into this poor guy's foot. And so it's uh, particularly, I think, common in areas that where people have, you know, uh, I think are walking around a lot in bare feet and have uh, high poverty rates. So really, um, really terrible. And uh, like Dr. Moore said, it's almost kind of like the, how we have crusted scabies being the real extreme form of scabies. It's almost like crusted tungiasis. So that's good. So if no one's ever coined that before, it was coined here today by Dr. Kayla Moore on uh, May 8th, 2020. And now we can document it in the video. So, all right. So Tunga Panatrans, I've, I've treasured that slide for a long time. And now this is the first time that I'm, that I'm uh, sharing it with all of you guys. I hope that you, um, that you enjoyed it because it's, it's pretty, pretty dramatic, huh? Wowzers. Okay. Next case. This is um, a lesion on the, the uh, cutaneous upper lip. Uh, I think it was sent in as a shave biopsy rule out to basal cell carcinoma, if I recall. And there's uh, some crust and scale here, some spongiosis in the epidermis, some kind of mm, atypical, if you like, uh, keratinocytes, but it doesn't really look right for like, say an actinic keratosis. Not much solar damage. Um, I think the person was maybe in their 30s, if I recall. I, I can't remember exactly. Something wonky and weird going on here. This looks to me like a sweat duct that's got um, squamous metaplasia. When sweat ducts get irritated or damaged, they get this kind of squamatized, kind of glassy look um, that makes them look kind of atypical. There's a lot of inflammation underneath here. So when I saw this, I wasn't really sure what was going on if this. Um, some sort of you know, rosacea papule maybe because of the inflammation around the follicles um, or if it was an excoriation that we were at the edge of. Um, I didn't see any cancer, but what I typically do in a situation like this where they want cancer clinically, I don't have a real good explanation for what's going on, is I like to cut deepers. Um, and I think uh, my uh, residents here already know this, but my, my new to be residents at Geisinger probably don't know this yet. But what I tend to do is if I if I've already extracted as much information as I can get from the biopsy and I still don't have a good answer, um, then I, and usually in, when they're wanting clinically something that's like basal or squame or a, or a cancer, I will often exhaust the block, just cut through the block. And I will, instead of, I don't wanna see ribbons after ribbons of tissue, that's not gonna help me. And it's gonna take a lot of extra time to look at all those and, and no extra yield diagnostically. So what I actually have our lab do is I've trained them to do deeper exhaust times five. So they'll cut all the way through the block and they'll take five, pieces of tissue along the way onto the slide. So I'll have five snapshots as they've cut through the block. And I find that I like doing this because when I do levels times three, sometimes I'm left with, well, hmm, there's still a little area there that's funny. I wonder maybe it's even deeper in the block. And I'd find that I'd, I'd end up ordering several times, several rounds of levels, and that would take extra time. And there's extra work for the histo lab to have to get the block out again. And I thought, you know, just exhausting through it is, is pretty good. Yes, every once in a while, you'll run into something on the exhaust levels that you'll think, oh, I wish I would have had this stuff left in the block to do stains. But I, in my experience, that's actually pretty infrequent in, in this setting. Obviously, not every setting that's appropriate. But anyway, so now 
now you've learned. I can't remember this one. I might have only done. Oh no, I think I did exhaust that. I just took the best level. So here's the here's the 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 deeper levels into the block. Turn it around here. Still nothing exactly. Hold on, let me start with the this one because I think this is the one that we got into first, and then that one's the deeper one. I've flipped it around. It is starting to get into an ulcer here. Look at this. What's going on? Does anyone have any ideas? Caitlin's not allowed to answer because she knows this case. Herpes. What's that? Herpes. Herpes. Very good. Look how subtle. They did not clinically suspect herpes. It was a single lesion, so probably a cold sore. It was on the upper lip. But this is a great example of the power of levels, right? And so I love these examples. I continue to be amazed by things that show up on levels. And I love to show those to the residents and fellows to remind them this is why we do levels so often. Sometimes I think it feels ridiculous. Like, well, let's do levels just in case. Because a lot of times it doesn't change anything. But there's sometimes you get a real home run win. And I, I think seeing those cases really uh, helps you to learn. And so, yeah, here, it's, this is really the only area, right? Over here, I think all of the stuff around it is the brisk reactive kind of inflammatory host response that herpes often incites. So I've seen with herpes, I've seen lichenoid interface change. I've seen superficial and deep perivascular inflammation. Uh, particularly, I remember a case in, in residency where it was like really brisk, superficial, and deep lymphocytes mostly. Um, and then on deepers, the herpetic uh, blister like was real obvious. So this is a case kind of like one I don't, I wish I would have saved that case from residency, but it was so long ago, I don't even know how I'd be able to find it now. But it was a great, a great learning lesson for me. Uh, we were just talking today um, about uh, how you can have a kind of a vasculitic sort of pattern sometimes in, um, in um, association with herpes. So it can really induce a variety of changes. Also, you can have hair follicle involvement and sebaceous gland necrosis is a particularly a uh, uh, strong indicator for herpes. This case doesn't um, have any visible sebaceous necrosis, but that's something I always think of is if I see dead sebaceous glands and hair follicles, herpes is the first thing that I try to think of. So um, we, and I think over on this piece, if I recall, it really became a lot more obvious that we were dealing you can really see it starting to make a blister. You've got the nice molding, margination, multinucleation, uh, enlargement of keratinocyte nuclei. And then uh, here is the herpes immunostain to confirm that we are indeed actually looking at herpetic viral change. And very nice, really brisk stain. The herpes stains seem to work quite well. So if you're like, oh, is this a little bit of brown enough? The answer is no. Herpes, in my experience, when the stain's positive, it is positive. It's really positive and blazing so. And oftentimes will kind of leak and, and spill under the surrounding tissue. So a really good example of a papule, a little vesicle of herpes. Uh, this is herpes simplex virus immunostain. And the immunostain we have is a combo of one and two uh, together. So um, if we needed to sort that out, we could always uh, send out to get different stains, but we have a combo stain um, in our lab. So this is a, a, but probably given the site, probably is HSV1. So really, really cool example. Um, herpes isn't, isn't that rare or anything, but I think it's a nice learning uh, lesson from the, uh, the deeper levels. Okay. So this is a pretty, pretty stellar case. Anyone want to take a shot from, from this view, from low power? Verusiform xanthoma, we've got one option. That's a good thought. So you can either, either type it in chat if you want to guess, or you can unmute yourself and say what you think. Um, got to vote for maybe reticular histocytoma. So I think that person is looking at this area here maybe and wondering what's going on. So to me, I think it looks like we have two different areas. This is a, a biphasic lesion, right? We've got something here, and then this area looks totally different from the rest, some sort of a combo. And that's exactly what we're dealing with, is a combo sort of situation. So let's look at this part first. So to me, I mean, this looks pretty nice, I think, for a seborrheic keratosis. It's kind of one of those kind of warty, pedunculated uh, looking ones. 
and um, the cells are a little bit irritated and you get a little bit of some kind of squamous eddy formation, but not terribly atypical. Um, although in irritated and inflamed subs, of course, you can have some uh, cytologic atypia. Um, it's totally understandable. You could also argue and say, well, this could be a Veruca. Maybe those are like coilocytes. I don't think so, but the hypergranulosis would go with Veruca. And I think Verucas and uh, seborrheic keratosis can have quite a bit of overlap. There's nice horned pseudocysts here though. See, those are really nice for seborrheic keratosis. So I, in my opinion, this is a, a big seb. Now let's go look at this area over here and see what's going on. So this is a, a mixture of different kind of cells and patterns in here. Okay, any takers now? I see someone saying maybe melanoma with Seb. That's an idea, certainly possible. So we've got kind of these islands of atypical cells that look like keratinocytes to me. They've got dense uh, pink cytoplasm. They're kind of have this funny kind of cell within a cell sort of thing that we sometimes see in keratinocytic um, lesions. There's atypical nuclei. So to me, this looks like a squamous cell carcinoma. And then additionally, in between it, there's spindle cells. And the spindle cells also look atypical, have mitotic activity. So what would you call a lesion like this? What name could you apply? Ignore, ignore the seb for a minute. If, what, what would you apply when you see islands of what look like carcinoma? And then in between you see malignant cells, some of which are epithelioid, but the, they become quite spindly. Yeah, so I would call this a carcinosarcoma if you want to get fancy, okay? Exactly, good job, guys. So to me, um, there, there's two terms that kind of have overlap, sarcomatoid carcinoma and carcinosarcoma. In my belief, I think that those are just two different um, morphologic patterns of the same thing. I think that they both represent a carcinoma that has become so poorly differentiated that it has areas that look like sarcoma, that look like malignant spindle cells, okay? But the way that those terms are often applied is that sarcomatoid carcinoma is totally spindled. It All of it looks like sarcoma, looks like malignant spindle cell tumor, but there's, there's some evidence either immunohistochemically or from the background uh, of in situ carcinoma, that it, that it is actually a carcinoma. Usually it'll look like a, a malignant spindle cell thing and then you'll stain it and it stains for keratin or, or P63 or P40, something like that. Whereas carcinosarcoma usually has an obvious carcinoma component and an obvious sp malignant spindle cell component. So like this, it's got obvious epithelial areas that are nested islands of atypical um, epithelioid cells. And then here it's got sheets of malignant spindle cells and so it's a biphasic lesion that has a, an obvious carcinoma and an obvious spindle cell looking component. And, um, but again, whichever term you use, they both to me represent just different variations and pattern of the same concept of, of a malignant, um, of, a, of a carcinoma that's become so poorly differentiated, it starts to look like a sarcoma. So in these, if you do, I think in this case, if I recall, the keratin actually stained a lot of the spindle cells as well as, of course, the islands of, of carcinoma, but sometimes you can have partial or even complete loss of epithelial markers in the spindled component in a, in a carcinosarcoma. So that doesn't, uh, that doesn't detract from the diagnosis for me. It's the, for um, uh, Dr. Newton who mentioned the idea of melanoma, that is certainly a, a good thing to consider because that would be a big thing to miss, right? This is a, if this is a poorly differentiated carcinoma, a carcinosarcoma, the, most likely they're probably gonna do all right after having this excision. Certainly it's possible a lesion this big could metastasize, but if this were a melanoma, for example, then this would be a big problem, right? This would be a, a very high risk melanoma that'd be very likely to metastasize. And so I'm never opposed to, when you see a malignant, ugly, poorly differentiated lesion, um, I'm never opposed to thinking about the idea of a collision uh, tumor. So you asked, is pagetoid spread uh, typical with these? I don't know, actually. I would say maybe not, but I have to admit, I don't see a lot of these. I see quite a few sarcomatoid carcinomas or what I usually call spindle cell squame um, because someone a long time ago told me, you know, if you say sarcomatoid carcinoma, sometimes that really spooks people um, and makes them think it's much more atypical. And if you just say spindle cell squame or poorly deaf squame with spindle cell features, uh, the dermatologists understand and are more familiar with that terminology and um, to me, it's the same thing. A sarcomatoid squamous cell carcinoma is the same thing as a spindle cell squamous cell carcinoma. They're both 
poorly differentiated squames that have spindle cells. So I don't know the answer to your question, uh, Dr. Wilson, if there, if pageant spread is common. I would, I would guess no. Like here, I think what we have, so, so what I think we have happening here, let's go back to low power, is I think that this is a seborrheic keratosis that had malignant transformation into a squamous cell carcinoma, and that squame became poorly differentiated enough that it turned into carcinosarcoma. So carcinosarcoma arising out of a seb. Crazy, huh? We see a bunch of sebs, but we don't see carcinomas at all, of any sort arise out of sebs very often. It happens, but it's relatively uncommon, especially considering how many sebs we, we see. So for those of you dermatologists watching, you know, when you uh, want to uh, uh, biopsy something that's a changing or growing thing that otherwise looks like a seb, it's not unreasonable to do that, not only for the fact that the patient's, um, uh, you know, very uncomfortable, obviously, but uh, also because there are rare times where we can see malignancy either right next to a seb or arising in the middle of a seb. So, um, and someone asked, is there a clear um, EMT, epithelial mesenchymal transition? Well, I think so, actually. I think right here, I would argue, you can see definitely like in situ carcinoma, nests of invasion. And then to me, I, it really looks like these cells are transitioning into these and you can see they're still epithelioid here, but they're becoming in, dis they're in uh, sheets, diffuse sheets rather than organized nests. And as you track and follow those over, what do they do? They start spindling out. So I think that's a really nice example that we, we rarely get to see such a nice transition um, in, uh, in uh, carcinomas that get spindle cell component. So this is kind of a, a nice case for multiple reasons. And the, uh, also I was just so impressed, my histology lab, look at that cut. That is like perfection, no wrinkles or folds, a little bit of fat tearing, which doesn't matter how good you are, you can't do anything about that. So um, anyway, if you're a histotech watching this in the future, total shout out to you guys. I tell my histotechs all the time, if it wasn't for their amazing skill doing something that I can barely do, um, even with a lot of, of hard work, I can barely pull off cutting a really nice slide. Um, they, they make just magically beautiful slides that really enable us to do our job. So I have huge respect for histotechnologists. So, you know, buy your histotechs donuts or something, or if nothing else, just tell them that they're awesome and that you really appreciate them. You know, in, in, in time for philosophy and, and team, team talk for a second, that's actually really important to do. Because you know what, you don't want the only time that your lab sees you to be when you're coming there asking them to rush something, or please hurry up, or why is this delayed, or why did this specimen get swapped? It's important to have those conversations, but you want to also go there when there's positive things. If nothing else, it will make them not dread seeing you, hopefully. But the other thing is, is I think it helps because when you build that rapport with your team, then when you go in and say, hey, can you guys rush this because this is a kid who's really sick and I'm worried that they might have leukemia or something, then they understand, right? They respect and they know that the reason that you're asking for something isn't because you're being demanding or, or, um, or um, selfish, but it's that, that you're actually trying to take care of the patient and that they're on the team with you helping to do that. And so I really think that that, that really helps um, everyone to, to feel like they're part of the team when they understand why that what they're doing is so important. So anyway, there's my little philosophy lesson for the day. Okay, let's transition. So these have been on Path Presenter. Let me go over to Kiko now and show you a different case. All right, here's the next case. Anyone wanna take a guess from this power? It's always good to try at low power, even if you totally fail, because the more you try at low power and get things wrong, then you'll realize, oh, I always struggle with recognizing that at 2x. Or you'll realize, oh, I actually can recognize it from 2x, and, and that's something that I can do. And it's, it's hard when you're a junior to stretch yourself diagnostically, because we don't like to be bad at things. We like to be good and to get the diagnosis right. But try at low power, then go into higher power and see the answer. Then go back to low power and see, could I have seen it from 2x? Sometimes you can't. There's certain things I know I can't see at 2x. I cannot diagnose erythrasma at 2x, okay? I got to go to like 40x or maybe even 60x to find those little guys. But um, our awesome fellow, Dr. Caitlin Campbell, nailed it. Yeah, this is granuloma facial, even from here. And this, you, you guys, uh, some of you know, I do not love the concept of Gren zone in general. Some derm paths talk about Gren zone a lot. I just don't feel it's diagnostically helpful for very many things, but this is the one exception. I think that G facial almost always has a Gren zone. And a Gren zone for the, the junior people is this zone of uninvolved dermis between the dermal lesion and the epidermis. There's a little zone of spared dermis at the top. And I agree that it almost every case, probably every case of G, G facial that I've ever seen has this little 
thin band of epidermis that's uninvolved for some reason. Um, and so when we go to higher power, what granuloma facial is, you might ask, where's the granuloma? And the answer is, it's in the entity name only. There is no granuloma in granuloma facial. It is a mixture of lymphocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, histiocytes, maybe some plasma cells, all mingled together happily as a family and filling up the dermis, okay? So uh, these usually, um, uh, for my pathologists uh, watching this, these are usually one or multiple papules or nodules on the face, kind of a purple or reddish brown color to them oftentimes. And they often have a kind of distinct look clinically. I feel a lot of times the dermatologists will suspect G facial when they send this in. And um, Dr. Otkin, uh, one of our senior derm residents, just the other day taught me something. We, this is not the same case as we had, but we just had a nice granuloma facial not long ago. And I was pointing out, look, this fills the dermis, but kind of leaves the follicles and the adnexal structures alone. And she said that, you know, clinically, when you look at them up close, they're this kind of firm, um, you know, dermal process that's, you know, that, that you can tell that the dermis is filled with something, but you can still see the individual hair follicle openings usually. And it gives us these little kind of like dots, almost like orange skin looking, not really peau d'orange, but kind of the little, little dots of the openings of the follicle, she said, you can usually see. And that was cool. I, I, maybe other people have noticed that before, but I never put together the fact that that makes perfect sense because look, you can see how each of the follicles is spared and not destroyed. This process is kind of filling in the dermis in between all of the structures that are already there. And I think that as a general rule, that's a thing we see with a lot of diseases that are infiltrates. Infiltrate things, things that are usually, you know, white blood cell uh, in origin, they tend to fill in all the spaces that are there and kind of leave the normal structures intact oftentimes. Okay, so let's look closer at the different components. Lots of EOs, histiocytes, lymphocytes, but to me, the most important cell in the infiltrate in granuloma facial is the neutrophils. Because neutrophils, you can see lymphocytes, histiocytes, and EOs in lots of things, bug bites and, and all, you know, ruptured cysts and everything. But the way the neutrophils are here, they're just kind of evenly scattered. See how they're just speckled, like little ants crawling all throughout here, right? That's a very distinct pattern, the way that the neutrophils are just kind of nicely intermingled with all of the other cells. If you have something infectious, for example, you usually see little pockets, like little micro abscesses, pockets and collections of neutrophils in the middle of a mixed infiltrate. Um, and uh, you, the fact that you just have them so scattered here is very, to me, very characteristic. Even at this power, if I didn't see anything else, this, this pattern of neutrophils looks very much like granuloma facial. So the take home point is remember that it's on the face and kind of purple, sometimes multiple, um, and that microscopic, you have, you have, microscopically you have all these cell types, but with, uh, with the nice uh, scattering of neutrophils in the midst of them. And um, the other thing is that if, uh, to remember is that granuloma facial um, is probably related to or on a spectrum with uh, EED, erythema elevatum diutinum, okay, which is actually quite rare. I've only seen a couple cases in all of my time in training and practice. Uh, it's, a, it's really a rare disease. And both of those diseases are basically thought of as a form of vasculitic disease. And the vasculitis begins to get uh, concentric fibrosis and sclerosis. So in G facial, there may be some subtle vasculitis, but in my experience, it's usually relatively subtle and sparse if it's present at all. In EED, it's usually more abundant and present. And again, it goes with a lot of sclerosis. So I've seen cases of G facial that started to have some EED appearance, some of the onion skinning fibrosis around vessels. But usually EED looks different clinically. It's bigger, like more firm lesions because it's fibrous. And it will have much more abundant fibrosis and sclerosis in addition to vasculitis, okay? So just know that those two probably are in some way related. And if you want to see an example, I have a video on my YouTube channel of, um, about leukocytoclastic vasculitis. It's kind of a long video, but in there, I do go over, I believe, one case of EED that's a, a pretty nice example. So if you want to see a good case of EED, go check out my leukocytoclastic vasculitis video, and it'll be there. And again, finally, remember that despite the name, there is no granuloma in granuloma facial. Okay, any questions? Okay, guys, we'll go until my voice goes out. I'm getting excited. It's my second win for a Friday afternoon. So, oh, this is an amazing case, too. I know I say that about a lot of cases, but it's because I see a lot of really interesting stuff. So, 
All right. What do you guys think this is from here? Give me some, some ideas. I can't remember the clinical on this, but I think it was like a red to purple nodule on the, the leg, if I recall, of an older adult. Okay, we got a vote for Kaposi sarcoma. Great idea. Infectious granuloma, that's a great idea because the idea that maybe this could be a central focus of necrosis. There's pink stuff in here that looks kind of homogenous and mixed together. And that's a great, a great pickup. And it definitely looks different from the color of the background dermis, which has a lot of elastosis, solar elastosis, but also there is some collagen here and that color looks different from that. Good. Anything else? Okay, we'll go a little closer. Someone thought about epithelioid sarcoma. Bravo, Dr. Moore. That's not what it is, but I love that you thought about it because it had the idea of a central zone of necrosis with a ring of cells around the outside. And I, the goal is that you always think of epithelioid sarcoma and be wrong and it not be that. Because the time you don't think of it, that's the time you miss it. And it's so rare, you might see it once in your career. I mean, even as a sarcoma pathologist, I probably only see it once or twice a year, maybe. And sometimes I'll go a year or two without seeing any cases, which always makes me nervous but I try to think about it all the time and look for it. Someone thought about tuberculosis? Yeah, that'd be possible. Let's go look at what's going on in the outside. What kind of cells are these? So I'm reassured that it's not epithelioid sarcoma because they definitely don't look like the atypical epithelioid cells. Granuloma is still a possibility. They look kind of like histiocytes, but there are some blood vessel lumens in here too. Mixture of lymphs, EOs, histiocytes. So, you know, infection, that's possible. Let's go look in the middle. There are actually some vessels here, and I, I don't have the, unfortunately, I don't have the scan of it or the pick of it handy, but I did actually a vascular stain, and this is a largely composed of a lot of blood vessels, certainly a bunch of mixed inflammation in there, but there are many blood vessels in here. Now, can someone tell me the diagnosis? because this is the field that you need to make the diagnosis. Once you know what this is and that you're looking for, this is the diagnostic field. Very good. This is bacillary angiomatosis. Well done, Dr. Campbell. Excellent work. These are thankfully quite rare nowadays. Um, this is, I think this is one of only a couple cases that I personally diagnosed in practice in eight years. Um, in the old days before um, when the AIDS epidemic was happening and there was no um, antiretroviral therapy yet, vascular angiomatosis had become relatively common. Um, as most of you re probably remember, this is caused by Bartonella hensley, the same, and you can also, there's a couple other Bartonella species I think that can cause it sometimes, maybe Quintana can, I can't remember. Someone can, can type in and correct me, but, but the main one is Bartonella hensley. It's the same organism that causes cat scratch disease. Um, and in people that are severely immunosuppressed, particularly in AIDS patients, it can cause this really dramatic reactive vascular proliferation. So here, this is all a nodule of reactive increased vessels with a bunch of inflammation mixed with it. All this stuff in the center that looks like necrosis is actually fibrin. And fibrin, it, the, this is not always there. It's, uh, some cases are a lot more cellular than this, but this case is kind of interesting because it had a bunch of fibrin. Fibrin and necrosis look quite a lot like each other, and sometimes I can't even tell them apart, okay? So um, I, that's been on my list of things to make a video about for some time, about pink, pink homogenous stuff, amyloid, necrosis, collagen, because those things can be hard to tell apart for beginners and even for people that do this a lot. But the key that I was pointing out here, this is the organism. These little hazy, fluffy purple clouds there, 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 here, those are clusters of Bartonella organisms. The individual organisms, even with uh, a light microscope and not a scan site, are too small to see. Um, they just show up as these little hazy colonies, but they always have this look like that of a kind of hazy colony. So um, it's a really nice example. And if you people talk about doing the Warthin starry stain to help highlight them, um, in my experience, I, I've seen pictures of some Warthin starries that labs do that look really nice but I've never seen one of those in real life. I, I feel like most people really struggle to get Worth and Starry to work the right way. It's super dirty, has lots of background debris. Um, so um, in my, uh, I don't think we don't even offer it in our lab anymore because we don't need it because for 
For syphilis, we don't do it. We do a spirochete immunostain. If I really needed to help here, I would just send it out for PCR to test for Bartonella. Um, okay, but in this case, I think this looks like a slam dunk and nothing else needed. I don't believe this patient was AIDS patient. I think that they were immune, uh, an older patient that was immune suppressed. I can't remember if it was either immune suppression from their old age or if they actually had, um, if they actually were on immunosuppressive drugs. I, I can't recall the, the situation, but a really nice example. And that is just to remember that that's what you're looking for, those purple colonies. Let's go look at the other piece and see if there's any, anything else over here. And the other take home point to remember about there, those colonies right there, see? With practice, you can tell they just have a very distinct look. And um, with, um, oh, and there's more. There, 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 there. Some cases have a lot of neutrophils, and some cases are a lot more vascular than this and look very much like a pyogenic granuloma, lobular capillary hemangioma. And if you, um, if you the kind of uh, general pearl is if I see something that I think looks kind of like a PG, a pyogenic granuloma, and then I see like little neutrophil abscesses in the middle of it or something funny about it, I go start hunting around to see if I can find these colonies because they can look, it looks quite a bit like um, PG sometimes. Now this particular case does not, but that's a good take home though. If you see something that looks like a super inflamed PG, you know, PG often has a lot of inflammation on the top, but if you see a bunch of inflammatory stuff down in the middle or something funny about it, then start hunting around to see if it could possibly be this. And sometimes the vessels in vascular angiomatosis can become quite atypical looking. The endothelial cells get very large and revved up. And um, uh, a very well-known soft tissue pathologist once told me that she had gone over some old cases and found, um, found examples from the old days before people really knew about vascular angiomatosis that have been diagnosed as angiosarcoma, misdiagnosed, because they looked so scary and people didn't recognize that it was vascular angiomatosis. It was before the, before the days of the, the AIDS or the early days of the AIDS epidemic when it wasn't recognized yet. So that was a real, and, um, and it, was, uh, it was a very well-known pathologist told me this and the person who had seen it and misdiagnosed it was another in long ago, very, very skilled uh, pathologist in the olden days who really knew what they were doing. So I, I always learn so much when I hear stories about people that are very, very good pathologists and still struggle to recognize something or make a mistake. And the reason to pass those on is not to ever shame those people, but because I think if they made that mistake, then I know I could make that mistake. And that has taught me and that has saved me multiple times in practice. And so I always am so very thankful for my mentors telling me the mistakes they've made and the diagnostic struggles they've had or that others they've known have had. And I try to pass that stuff on to all of you as trainees because I think that that's a really great way to recognize pitfalls and hopefully avoid them, which will keep you out of trouble and also hopefully protect your patients. So I think it's really important that kind of storytelling is important. And that's the stuff that doesn't get put in the books very much. And so I think that these videos and stuff like this are a great way to make sure that that, that kind of lesson gets passed on. Um, and if it saves one patient one day, then it's totally worth it. Okay, bacillary and geomatosis. Now here's something that's uh, not super rare, uh, but it's something we don't see biopsies of very often, and just kind of a nice example. So anyone can take a shot at it when they think they know what it is. Any takers from there? Oh, someone guessed something. Okay, we got some guesses, good. Yes, yeah, so Dr. Newton, you're right. This is in Pitigo. And um, it is the epidermis has got a little spongiosis and some reactive changes, but the main finding here is this thick layer of scale crust on the top. And for, for new, new people here, first year, scale crust means a mixture of scale is parakeratosis, this. That's para, so that's the scale. Crust is serum, this stuff, the pink homogenized fluid that's seeped up through the epidermis. And when you have it together, it's scale crust. And that's clinically the scabby, crusty, scaly stuff that you see on the skin um, uh, in weepy sort of skin lesions that dry up. That's what it looks like microscopically. So the mixture of para and serum and neutrophils and inflammatory debris. And then of course in here, look what we have. Nice colonies of cocci bacteria. The individual single bacteria don't stand out quite as well um, on a scan slide, but you can usually see cocci bacteria very nicely on the microscope. Um, they're very uniform and round and they look all just like each other. So this is a nice example of uh, impetigo. And what's the, the common organism that causes impetigo usually? Yeah, so good, so the staph organisms. 
that can, can grow and, and cause impetigo. And, and this is basically that honey colored crust that you see on the patient. Um, this is what that looks like microscopically. Of course, keep in mind that we see secondary impetigo or impetigenization on the surface of the skin in lots of different things. I see it over top of basal cells and excoriations and any sort of ulcerated thing. We also see it in the context of inflammatory dermatoses, particularly like um, spongiotic dermatitis. So um, here they actually, I can't remember why they biopsied it. They did have something else in their differential and they wanted to confirm that this really was impetigo. So that's why it got biopsied. And I thought, wow, this is nice because we just, it's usually recognized clinically and treated and not biopsied. Um, so the fact that we got a biopsy of it was really, really useful in this case. And I thought it was a nice example. But um, the secondary uh, impetigenization is what I see much more commonly. And the, uh, the times I report it, I don't always mention when there's impetigenization there. Like if there's bacteria over a basal or an excoriation, does that really matter? There's gonna be bacteria anytime you got an open ulcerated area on the skin. When I mention it, when I'm, I try to make sure I mention it is in the context of inflammatory dermatoses, particularly sponge derm, patients that have atopic dermatitis and then get secondary impetigo change and bacterial overgrowth, sometimes that can make it a lot harder, of course, to manage their, um, their um, sponge derm, their atopic derm. So applying steroids won't necessarily help because they've got all these bacteria here kind of driving the, um, the inflammatory process, I guess, is my kind of basic understanding. So I know at least some of the dermatologists that train me said that they like to give those patients the bleach bath to kind of decolonize them. I think there are other uh, antibacterial options that, that all of you who are dermatologists know a lot more than me to help uh, reduce the bacterial load on the surface and then allowing you to use the steroids to treat. So that's one of those times where mentioning that can actually help the dermatologist uh, better manage the patient. Um, and you know, sometimes we think, oh, it's just a rash, but Anyone, anyone here, of course, the derms all know just a rash is, is nonsense. There are some rashes that are severe, miserable, quality of life, morbidity issues for patients, even though they're not going to maybe kill the patient and it's not a tumor, it can still cause dramatic morbidity for patients. Um, and so anything I can do to help uh, the dermatologist figure out a better way to manage a rash or an inflammatory process and make the patient better um, is something I try to do. So for the pathologist here, I think that's important. We're often, you know, kind of are afraid of rashes uh, if you're not term path trained, because, you know, there's a lot of different subtleties and nuance, and that's true, but just got, by identifying the inflammatory pattern, having a discussion with the dermatologist, even saying, hey, I'm not a derm path, but here's what I'm seeing. Tell me what of that would fit with what's on your differential and, and being willing to, to do what, you know, what's needed to get a diagnosis for them. That can be helpful because you know, there's a take-home point here is that, sorry, I'm, I'm feeling again philosophical today, but the take-home point here is that tumors, even if we can't figure it out, the dermatologists and the surgeons have something to do. They go and cut it out and make sure the margins are negative and sew the patient up and we hope for the best. That's not an ideal thing to say, well, it's a bad tumor. We're not sure what it is, but we're going to do surgery. But there's, a, there's something to do, right? But with a rash, if the rash doesn't go away, and we can't figure out what it is, guess what? The patient's still living with the, the rash and may be really uncomfortable. They're still coming to see the dermatologist and saying, doc, I'm not getting better. So it's a very frustrating situation, a persistent inflammatory dermatosis, frustrating for the patient and for the dermatologist. So um, I always want to do anything I can to help, help give as much information as possible in that, in that situation. And I think a lot of times pathologists don't don't think about it from that angle until we've until you've worked with dermatologists and seen you know how, how severe and problematic some of these inflammatory problems can be. So in this case, obviously, uh, this is uh, easily treatable situation in Patigo, but just do keep in mind that all of the things in the in the non-tumor world of dermpath are actually really important, and it's important to not blow them off. Okay. Now, this one we're going to zoom in, and if you're paying attention, you may have already seen the thing I'm trying to hide from you, but what's the diagnosis? Good. Yes, yes, all of you got it. This is chondrodermatitis nodularis helicis, CNH, okay? And the reason I'm zooming in is because, to me, the most helpful feature for CNH are these little clustered tiny blood vessels in the dermis right next to this fibrin fibrinoid necrosis okay i think these vessels are so characteristic and usually just you show me this and i can say this is going to be cnh except this one time that i was so sure it'd be cnh 
and I was looking at the slide and I was like, don't tell me the history. And I went on and on describing how it was going to be CNH and it was from the forearm. And I, every time I said something was going to be CNH I, and that resident was around, um, I always, um, is Dr. McCaslin who's graduated previously, I was always like, oh, uh, Lauren McCaslin will never believe me because I, there was that time I was so sure and then it was forearm CNH. And I even went back, I was like, surely this is swapped. I just couldn't let go of the fact and eventually I had to just accept that I was wrong. So maybe the vessels aren't 100% specific, but they're pretty darn good. Okay, now let's go back to low power and start again. See, this is, this is like my confession time. I get to tell you guys all the ways that I've made mistakes and messed up and, um, and it, it soothes my soul and atones for my errors. So here is cartilage, okay? And some, oh, the forearm CNH, someone asked what it was. I actually don't know. I just ended up saying there's reactive vessels and some, and obviously there was no cartilage under it since, you know, it was the forearm. But um, I could never figure out what it was. It was no tumor and I just had to be descriptive. So it was very unsatisfying for multiple reasons. And yeah, I was always embarrassed around Dr. McCaslin. Anytime I was, if she ever watched this video, she's probably gonna be unhappy that I, I called her out by name, but well, here we are. So um, yeah, but every time I was like, oh, this is great CNH. And then I was like, oh, she'll never believe, she'll say, mm -hmm, I bet it's the forearm, isn't it? So anyway, it was a nice running joke. So here's the cartilage, okay? And it's great when you have the cartilage. And the idea is that CNH, for, for those of you who don't know, is often a painful nodule that tends to ulcerate either on the helix or the anti-helix. And I think that it, I've, some people have told me the anti-helix is actually more commonly where you see it, okay? But if you see anti-helix or helix of the ear and you get um, a painful nodule clinically, the differential usually is between squamous cell carcinoma and, um, and chondrodermatitis nodularis helicis, okay? And someone asked, can diffuse dermal angiomatosis have similar looking vessels? Yes. Uh, Dr. Neimeyer, that's a great question. It can. And the, the concept here is very similar. Diffuse dermal angiomatosis, uh, for everyone here, is, this, this, um, uh, is a process where you get reactive proliferation of blood vessels in the dermis due to chronic ischemic change. We see that kind of pattern on the lower leg in people with arterial insufficiency over long term. They don't have good arterial flow. The leg is kind of got a chronic hypoxia, chronic low level ischemia. And the dermis is trying to comp compensate for that and growing new blood vessels to better oxygenate the skin. That's the basic simple way I think of it. We also see diffuse dermal angiomatosis on the breast, on larger breasts, particularly in people that have an underlying coag issue or are smokers. And they get this really brisk reactive proliferation of vessels in the dermis, okay? And I've seen similar changes in the dermis over top of calciphylaxis. Um, actually, if you want to see an example of that, I did a video for the College of American Pathologists. It's not on my YouTube channel yet. It's on their website, though, and I'll, I'll send you guys a link later. And for those of you watching on YouTube, I'll try to remember to put that down in the video description. Um, and I show a nice example of a case of a calciphylaxis that had really robust diffuse dermal angiomatosis. Usually, I would say the, the one thing that would help me here, Dr. Neimeyer, is the vessel changes here are just right here. There's a little bit out here, but by the time you're out there, or over here, the vessels are relatively normal looking out here. We're just back to their really cooked sun damaged skin. All the vascular changes are right here under this impending ulcer and near this fibrinoid necrosis. They're right around the edge. It's usually a zone of fibrinoid necrosis with a little edge of these vessels, okay? So the idea behind what causes CNH, what, what we think is that uh, particularly in older adults and you know the ears sometimes grow larger as people get older, and as people sleep, if they sleep on their side, the idea is that the ear being compressed between the head and the pillow for hours on end at night pushes the blood basically out of the tissue and they begin to get tissue ischemia. And that ischemia eventually starts to kill part of the dermis. And the evidence that we have for this is that we get this reactive vessel change. That is the kind of vessels just like we see in, in other ischemic, uh, chronic ischemic conditions. Um, and then also we begin to get little zones. Sometimes it's small, sometimes it's a big zone of fibrinoid necrosis. Basically, the idea is that this portion of the dermis is starting to die, and then around it, we've got the vessels that are reacting, trying to bring in more blood flow. Part of the cartilage often starts to die and degenerate. Now, what does degenerated cartilage look like? Well, I look at a lot of cartilage because I am also a bone and soft tissue pathologist, and I have a hard time, honestly, explaining. I'll tell you what degenerated cartilage looks like is cartilage underneath CNH. I know it's degenerated because I know this is CNH. So you see the cartilage being there is not really the, the take home. The take home stuff is this, that's the diagnosis there, not the cartilage. But I would say that the cartilage usually has a smooth edge 
And in CNH, if you begin to get kind of individual chondrocyte clusters that kind of intermingle with the fibrous layer, I think this is like perichondrium, the fibrous layer around the cartilage, and it kind of starts to kind of space out a little bit, gets more pink looking, the color kind of starts changing. But I'll tell you, cartilage can have a lot of variability in its color depending on how the H&E stain is. So from lab to lab, and even sometimes from case to case, cartilage can look different. Sometimes it's really deep purple blue, other times not so much. Sometimes it has actually a pink kind of color, even in more normal situations. So I really don't rely as heavily on recognizing the degenerated cartilage. Um, and again, I'm someone who looks at cartilage a lot. I rely on this stuff to tell me if I'm dealing with CNH, coupled with the clinical scenario. You know, it's, it can't be on the forearm, it's gotta be on the ear. But um, I think it's, um, so it's nice when you see the cartilage, but you don't have to. If you just have a shave right through here and it's on the helix, that's CNH, we're done. And so then the idea is that as the dermis dies, the epidermis doesn't like having dead dermis underneath it. And so it tries to kind of reach down and grab that dead dermal collagen and fibrin and push it out. And that's called transepidermal elimination phenomenon. We see that in perforating disorders. We see that in, the, in foreign bodies, like splinters and other foreign bodies. The epidermis opens up and tries to extrude and push that, that foreign material out. And that's the same kind of concept that happens here. This stuff has become foreign and, and not what the body wants to have anymore. It's dead. So it's trying to push it out. And so sometimes in early CNH, there will be some epidermal um, acanthosis, but it won't be ulcerated yet. In more advanced examples, it will actually have a full-blown ulcer. So you don't have to have the ulcer there, but if you do, it's nice. But here we have one that's kind of like right on the verge of ulcerating, or maybe it's ulcerated a little bit further back and we're just not in the right plane of section uh, to see it, okay? So nice example of chondrodermatitis nodularis helicis. Let me show you another really dramatic example of it. And again, don't expect it to look this good always. It's usually a lot more subtle. But here's one where they actually did like a wedge. And this is a case I ended up seeing in consult. I still don't fully understand why um, such a dramatic procedure was done. If they thought that if they were really worried it was a squam or if it was really painful, I don't know. The treatment, by the way, for CNH is oftentimes getting a donut pillow, right? So people lay on it and their ear doesn't get compressed and it allows the ear to not have that pressure-induced ischemia. Um, what other situation causes pressure-induced ischemia in the body? Not so much in the skin, but elsewhere in the body. This is good because we can tie all of these kind of unrelated diseases together with a common uh, underlying um, you know, uh, biologic or, or pathologic concept. Yes, sacral decubitus ulcer, right, exactly. It's the same kind of concept in decubitus ulcer and also in ischemic fasciitis, which is kind of on a, is kind of related to the changes you see under a decubitus ulcer. They both get this kind of ischemic fibrinoid necrosis and have proliferating vessels because of pressure-induced ischemia over a long time. Good. So here's the example. We can see the nice cartilage of the ear. Here's the helix up here, and look at that. You can see, this is a, a really good one. It's got the acanthotic epidermis kind of reaching down. It's got the ulcer where the, the dead and dying cartilage and dermis are being pushed out. It's got those little tiny vessels clustered together right at the periphery. It's got a little bit of fasciitis like reactive myofibroblastic stuff. And then look, now that's cartilage that anyone can say, that's not happy cartilage, right? It's just like fragmenting apart and, and coming out. And you can see the color change too. Look, you know, see down here, there is some pink in there, but it really gets kind of bright pink color, starts changing its color and its orientation, and it's fragmenting and breaking away and being extruded out. So definitely a really dramatic example of CNH here. And this is a great one for teaching, but I've never seen another one this dramatic, and I've never seen another one where it was wedged out with, a, with a, you know, an actual wedge that took a piece of the, uh, the uh, articular, I'm sorry, not articular, the uh, cartilage of the, uh, the helix here. So pretty dramatic example. Let's go over here to this side of the C. See on this side, you can't see the ulcer. So it's just a matter of sectioning, um, but you can still see those vessels. And here you actually see a piece of that dying cartilage getting close to being pushed out. So pretty, pretty fun case, nice example of chondrodermatitis nodularis helicis CNH. All right, we'll do one more and then we'll call it an afternoon. And this is just a quick little fun one. So this is a seborrheic keratosis, right? Acanthosis, corn pseudocysts. What happened to this seb? What's wrong with it? 
it's dead, right? Totally dead. You can tell because you can see the ghost outlines of individual keratinocytes, but their nuclei aren't purple anymore. And when you, when you, when a cell dies, the first thing to go away is its nucleus dissolves. The nucleic acids get broken down, and that's what makes the nucleus purple is the nucleic acids that bind to the, the hematoxylin, right? That makes them purple. So the first thing is the nuclei go away. The pink stuff is the the um, proteins, and the proteins are strong, you know, cables basically, long chains of amino acids. They take a lot longer to break down, and so that's why in, in coagulative necrosis you have basically ghost outlines of the cells for a while until it eventually gets broken down by the body. But as you guys figured out, this is a, a seb that was frozen. So someone said, let's hard freeze that seb with liquid nitrogen. And then um, a day or two later, uh, the patient, I can't remember exactly how many days, a couple days later, I think the patient probably had second thoughts about it when it became very swollen and painful and, and came back in and said, you know, please take this off. And so then it was shaved, removed. But the, uh, the history was not initially given, but we knew right away without being told the history that this clearly is a seb that, that died instantly by death by freezing, okay? And ischemia, the, the reason this, this is a fun, fun case just because it's kind of cool when you can figure out the history, right, by the pattern. But you can tell this happened really quickly because look, the corneal layer is like basket weed, right? It's totally normal corneal layer. The horn pseudocysts are totally normal. They don't even have any para in them. If the seb gets um, infarcted, if it's like one of those pedunculated ones, it gets kind of twisted on itself, part or all of the seb can die and get necrotic. Um, if the seb gets, you know, um, uh, gets really inflamed, part of it can die. Um, but in those situations where you have kind of a longer time till death, you start to get reactive, glassy looking keratinocytes. You get parakeratosis that starts building up sometimes in the horn pseudocysts or on the surface. You get reactive changes. Here, this thing is just a perfect ghost of a regular old seb. And so that's how we know it died quickly. And the other thing that causes quick death like this is acute ischemia. And so even though that's obviously not gonna cause death in a seb, recognizing this pattern of a totally ghosted out epidermis, that right there is a hugely super important derm path skill that every derm path should know. And in fact, every general pathologist should know. And I gave that lecture I was talking about earlier that I gave a lecture for, for the CAP and it was about dermatology urgencies and emergencies. And many of those involve acute ischemia things like DIC and, and coagulation issues where people get blocked blood vessels, calciphylaxis, things that can block off blood flow and cause death in the skin or angioinvasive fungus. Recognizing that pattern of ischemia is so important because it tells you something causes to die instantly. And in the case of uh, skin, you know, in, uh, in those situations I talked about, it usually is a vaso-occlusive process and that's often a very serious emergency issue that needs to be dealt with right away. So recognizing the pattern of, wow, the skin died right away is really important. But freezing injury will cause that same kind or really bad thermal injury can cause similar patterns where the whole, the whole tissue just dies right away and leaves you this. And you can also see the dermis is very edematous. The papillary dermis in between, where there used to be papillary dermis is all edema and the whole thing is just kind of lifted away. And obviously now it's becoming inflamed secondarily, but the inflammation came after the, the lesion was frozen. So I just think that's kind of a fun case. I've seen this before, but this was the best example of a, a nice big seb that was taken off that had clearly been frozen. And, and I applaud the dermatologists who did it because they froze that thing good. I mean, it is, it is all dead. They, they got it. I think they even got some, the dermis is like mostly dead too. They're a little couple fragments. So, so well done, um, whoever froze. And also for doing the nice big shave biopsy for us to enjoy. So um, that's a, a cryo frozen uh, seborrheic keratosis. And I think that gets us to three o'clock and I hope that that was um, enjoyable or at least a little bit entertaining for you guys. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them.